Hi, Hashim. Welcome to the conversations on big cats. This has just been something I've been wanting to do for so long. And now we have people from nine countries talking about eight species and their scientists and there's filmmakers and photographers and people working in conservation tourism. And, you know, having known you for most of my life and seeing the amazing things that started off with those wonderful Tiger Tops groups um, long, long ago, it was but obvious that I would turn around and say, Hashim, can you please talk to us about your unique special brand of conservation tourism, which has influenced so much of what has happened, especially in Central India, and now, of course, um, extending to snow leopards in Ladakh. So over to you, Hashim. Uh, that's that's really kind, Latika, and really good to see you. You know, as you say, I've known you and your family for, uh, you know, most of your life, certainly, and a lot of my life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's great. I mean, uh, do, do you want me to put the presentation on a little bit? Yes, or? please. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So let me just try and yeah, I'm going to mute that. myself. Yeah, okay, here we go. And oh, it's all uh, pretty much. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, you know, very briefly, uh, I came to conservation tourism, you know, like so many of us, completely by accident. And I won't call it conservation tourism in 1978. Uh, it was a whole lot of, a whole bunch of us having fun in the jungle. So let's not dignify it with any more than what it actually was. But, uh, you know, for many of us, the mothership was Tiger Top Jungle Lodge. That was the sort of pioneering uh, venture in the jungles of uh, southern Nepal. And the interesting th thing though was the fact that, you know, it started in, in the 1960s, in the early 1960s. There was a guy called John Copeland. I think you know the story. But that was still very much a hunting related tourism. You know, it was a wildlife tourism with very much a hunting theme. But in 1973, when India kind of uh, kicked off Project Tiger, the Wildlife Protection Act was uh, was enacted. Uh, you know, that pretty much indicated that tiger hunting was was done. And Nepal also followed suit very quickly, you know, also influenced by Guy Monquet and gang. And John Copeland, by this time, you know, uh, had to run away from Nepal. I mean, it was all a big dramatic story, which I'm sure Lisa has shared with you. The guys who took over, Chuck McDougall and, and Jim Edwards, actually ran a tiger hunting company in West Nepal. When they took over in 1973, however, Chuck, who was a passionate tiger lover and had actually made his career in the subcontinent because of tigers, although he was an anthropologist by trade, but it was tigers that brought him to the subcontinent. Uh, they knew that what they wanted to do was to conserve tigers. And the fact that uh, Jim had his own unique uh, uh, perception of conservation, Chuck McDougall was, of course, deeply embedded in, not only in the management of the park, but also in the research on tigers. Uh, he was a, a research associate with the very long-running Smithsonian Tiger Ecology Project, uh, which threw up so much of what we know of basic tiger ecology at the moment. I mean, that is the foundational knowledge. We all look to Shala and Deer and the Tiger, but people forget that a lot of the stuff we actually got to know was from the long-running Chitwan Project, and Chuck was one of the key people. So all of that began to influence us, and we called it wildlife tourism at that time. And the fact that, you know, this was there was a very uh, distinct and I would say deliberate change in focus from the hunting kind of romanticized, gun-toting, John Copeman, larger than life sort of thing to a typical, you know, downplay Chuck McDougall, hardcore scientist, very much tiger focused, conservation focused thing. And that rubbed off on all of us. You know, we didn't realize it, but it rubbed off on all of us. And of course, this is what Chuck came out with, you know, The Face of the Tiger, one of the classic books on wild tiger uh, land tenure systems in particular. And this was a tiger that we all knew very well. He, you know, Chuck called it Maila uh, He was the resident tiger in our area. And this was one of the great, one of the first great trap photographs or trip photographs that, you know, was taken in Nepal. From, from, from Chitwan, of course, you know, that whole uh, brand of wildlife tourism, it was still, I would still call it wildlife tourism, conservation tourism in all its many faceted splendor hadn't yet quite been coined. Uh, but that unique brand of Tiger Tops tourism was first actually imported to Southern India. And a lot of people don't know this, that N Nagarhole, the Kabini River Lodge was a Tiger Tops creation. And you know, and that is what kickstarted wildlife tourism in South India and actually gave it that conservation focus. 
because it was all Tiger Top trained people. It was a great sort of, you know, uh, Colonel John Wakefield, who was the director, the resident director, who, of course, knew your family uh, from before you were born. And you had Ramesh Mehra, uh, the very, very effective managing director of Jungle Lodges and Resorts. Jim Edwards, of course, was the guiding spirit. Chuck McDougal used to go there. And for a brief while, as I was director of operations for, for India, I used to go there quite a lot myself. Uh, but, you know, then you had the great naturalists who were Tiger Top strains. Sundar Raj, who was the chief naturalist for a long time. Murli, who was, you know, a fantastic scientist. So all of those guys gave South Indian wildlife tourism the conservation focus that it, it now has and has led to so much. But there was a learning process, which, you know, we all tend to also forget. When uh, Tiger Tops went down, Mr. Gundura was the, was the chief minister and Tiger Tops had gone on his invitation. And they tried to replicate the, the concession model of tourism by creating a wildlife lodge in the middle of the jungle at what is Mastiguri, you know, which was the area of the last Kheda, the place, uh, which is just opposite this point on the Kabini River. And of course, the formidable Ulas Karath wasn't having any of that, you know. And he mounted a very, very effective campaign in the press against it, quite rightly, in hindsight, and said, look, this is, this is uh, an elephant corridor. There's no way that you're going to have, you know, a wildlife, a big wildlife lodge over there. So that had to be sh shifted. And it has now gone to the Maharaj of Mysore's hunting lodge. And, you know, the two places were built over there. So Tiger Tops learned a lesson from there as well. And, you know, another sort of, you might say, another learning chapter was written into the conservation tourism book for India anyway, that we can't take concessionary exclusive lodges into our areas uh, where national parks are going to be declared. On the plus side, Jim Edwards was the one who stopped the teak felling, the logging in that area and insisted that that become a part of the Nagarhole National Park. So that was the huge plus that Tiger Tops brought into it, quite apart from its manner of operation, you know, and that is thriving now. And, you, you know, I mean, South India has now become the whole Western Ghat area, you know, that whole area we all know. I mean, it's one of the great, great uh, uh, wildlife tourism destinations for all of Asia, not just South Asia uh, over there. And then, of course, uh, you know, at the same time, they were talking to, they wanted to move into the central Indian uh, landscape. Uh, there were talks with the rights in Kanha, which didn't go very far. But they were also speaking to KK Singh. Uh, who had started a very small operation in the uh, in the Barajas Koti. And Bandhagar was, of course, fan fantastic. You know, I mean, we all remember what it was like in the days. You know, there's KK sitting over there, looking on the fort, looking out over the landscape that we all love so much. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting right here, looking at the fort. Although I can't say that, you know, there was a deliberate conservation tourism philosophy sort of guiding the growth of uh, the Bandhagar jungle of camp as it then was. But we learned a lot of lessons and the reason why we didn't need conservation tourism was because there was no tourism. There was just one lodge and the wonderful White Tiger Lodge, uh, which uh, Ranjit Singh Ji had made. And if you remember, the old White Tiger Lodge was actually built beautifully on the Charanganga River with just eight rooms. They've gone and made a monstrosity now. But that was it. There were three and a half jeeps in the park. So, you know, it was all very, very contained. It was all very sustainable. It was all very low key. It was stenting. It was, you know, all of that. But one of the interesting things, Latika, that happened over that time, I love this photograph. That's the old Pujari of uh, Ram Temple on top of the fort being watched by Banka, the first tiger that I started tracking and following. And he's watching him. And this is what, and this is a damn good comment on actually how tigers and humans coexist in the Indian landscape. But as we started spending more and more time over here, two things started happening. We started eyeballing tigers in a way that had only been done in Ranthambore before. You know, previously in Chitwan and so on, it was all in other places, it was either radio callers or tracking. Here we were having the unique opportunity of following individual tigers day in, day out, year in, year out, building up a huge repository of actual knowledge of their relationships and how interrelated tigers work together. So this was a great part of what was going on in Bandhukar and gave us an opportunity to actually add to our knowledge of tigers. So, you know, the whole thing about uh, all males being dangerous to all cubs was not just busted over here, but this is the famous Sita with her second litter. This is Sita on the right with her, uh, the male uh, from her first cub. Now, she was a young mother at the age of uh, when her first cubs were 16 months old, she had enough of them, got rid of them. And guess who looked after them? Their father looked after them. 
and we have actually recorded the father Baka looking after the cubs as early as the age of three to four months, calling them to a kill, which then Valmik wrote about, and I had actually record recorded this and written it up in the notes for the journal of the BNHS. So you know all of this was happening at the same time. We were noticing that as tourism grew over the you know the next sort of decade and a half, the density of tigers started increasing. So much so that now quite well-known tiger ecologist, tiger biologist, I should say, said to me once, he said, there are too many tigers in Bandhagar. A remark that kind of left me slightly speechless because, you know, I mean, you think, well, what's that supposed to mean? I mean, you know, tigers will do what they do. Uh, you know, I mean, how can you decide for them whether there's too many of them or not? But anyway, so that that was, if you remember, those were the heady days when Bandhagar, you know, had all those many tigers. Of course, they were overcounted. So anyway, so that was a huge learning experience and we kind of put two and two together and said, well, you know, what changed? What changed was the, the fact that tourism increased. So when it came turn for, for my friends and I to start a company, Wild India Camps, and start a new lodge, we abandoned Kanha and Bandhavgar, which still had very few tourist lodges in those days, and moved to Pench. And one of the things that, that, uh, that drove us there was the fact that Pench I'd had a conversation with Ulas Karan, who had done a study there. And he'd said to me privately, he said, you know, it seems to him that Page has a lower tiger number than the carrying capacity as indicated by Trey Biomass, which may indicate, he wasn't sure, but he said, you know, I mean, it could indicate selective poaching. So we wanted to test out two things. One, uh, that does, poach, does tourism actually improve tiger numbers? Is, does it actually is it actually an engine, a driver for conservation? And B, could we make a good enough model out there that short tiger numbers didn't necessarily, wasn't a barrier uh, for, for the growth of wildlife? So we moved to Pinch. Fantastic place. You know, uh, when we first, for the first couple of years, we had the park to ourselves. And you know, how exciting is that? You know, it was like Bandhavgarh and Kana in the old days. Sure enough, very few tiger sightings uh, in the early days, but brave numbers were huge. No reason why tigers shouldn't come back. And you know, very quickly the tigers were back. Uh, I mean, surprisingly quickly. And now, of course, you see all the hype about Paige, you know, having the tigresses with the highest breeding uh, records. And not surprising, it has a fantastic, uh, very, very high uh, prey biomass out there. So there's no reason. And that is one of the drivers we know. And from studies done in Chitwan, we know that adequate food supplies is a, is a massive thing. So we were quite happy with how, you know, what we did with Page, but very unhappy with the fact that government, despite, despite understanding that unregulated tourism is not a great advertisement for the industry, uh, didn't actually put in place the regulatory mechanisms to actually control how tourism grew over there. So very soon it became a mess again. And now Turia, sadly, uh, is hugely, hugely crowded. Although the protected area of the park is fabulous and, you know, tigers are humming. It's, you know, it's a success story. We then moved and, you know, here's an interesting thing, Latika. I'm just going to just look at the 2001 foreign numbers, 14, total number 5,274 of Indians, less than 3 lakhs rupees of uh, revenue. 2018-2019, over 3 lakhs of revenue. Uh, you know, numbers had grown massively. Look at that. Can you hear me, Latika? Hello. Yes, 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 absolutely. My, I'm on mute. Okay, uh, sorry. So now you can see what's what it's done. 2006, 2007. Just look at the increase in tiger population. And this was being done after 2006, when you know when a much more rigorous uh, censusing mechanism was used. And then from 2011, I don't have the numbers, but the the latest numbers are much much higher. They're sort of 53. Uh, for the uh, for the park and uh, uh, and so on. so you know I mean clearly tourism does play some part in the growth of tiger numbers uh, and in worst case scenario even if uh, tourism isn't the cause if you if you st still say deny that that tourism doesn't actually increase tiger numbers well it certainly doesn't decrease them uh, because every study has shown that. In Page, a very good study showed that uh, tiger numbers in the core area where, where tourism operated was exactly the same as outside the tourism zone. In fact, slightly higher densities in the tourism zone. So, you know, so that is a good thing. Then in 2007, when we wanted to build a new lodge, we moved to Satpura. 
And over there, we helped create uh, what I think is uh, for, for India a unique model, but basically replicated the model of tourism that I had grown up with in Nepal. And, you know, I mean, Satpura, uh, when we went, hardly any tigers, but a fantastic park for sloth bears, for leopards, for wild dogs, uh, fabulous scenery, great gore numbers, you know, terrific, uh, very, very high prey base, especially sambar and gore and wild boar. And so no reason why there shouldn't be more tigers over there. Well, the model of tourism that we kind of uh, discussed with, uh, with the government and, you know, put a note up to them, depended on three things. One, limited number of vehicles in the park, a much wider range of activities which centered around canoeing and, uh, and walking particularly, and allowing hides to come in and full day programs, you know, all the way to Churna and back. Now, what the canoeing did was it allowed us access. It did two things. It absorbed many of the fishermen who were overfishing this, this, uh, this lake as boat guides. It allowed these guys to go in quietly into inlets where, you know, where fishermen were quietly accessing with nobody following them. Nobody knew what they were doing there, how they were going there. They, and we found people camping there. And then when we started walking in two exclusive areas within the core zone, within the core area, uh, in the initial stages, we were surprising fishermen camping inside the park, inside the core area. Well, that very quickly stopped. And then over the years, you know, so, so you, and of course, it was a fabulous experience uh, to uh, to sort of enjoy the park in a way that you couldn't until then enjoy any other tiger reserve in the country. Uh, you know, the walking itself, of course, focusing a lot on signs and tracks and smaller animals, smaller wildlife. But every now and again, you'd meet a leopard, you'd meet a tiger, you'd meet a sloth bear. You know, you'd come across a herd of gore. It was just, you know, and, and for one whole season, the walking would be right in the middle of a pack of, uh, of denning dogs, of wild dogs. Similarly, the, the, the jeep rides, you know, it used to be only 12 jeeps. Uh, now I think it's 15. So, you know, what a fantastic way to experience a park. And I'm really happy that Madhya Pradesh has, uh, has maintained this, hasn't allowed this model to be diluted in any way. In fact, has improved on it with all the buffer zone tourism and the camping and the long time and the long hikes on the Foresight Trail. Well, guess what? Uh, tigers have started coming back into into the Satpura landscape and so you know overall although the control outside the park should probably be a bit better but on the whole I think Satpura uh, has been a great success story and, and for some some of this Paint and Satpura I guess we could take a little bit of credit for opening these parks and putting where our, uh, our money where our mouth uh, where our mouth is and actually saying well you know this is what we believe in and here we're going to actually invest in it and see what we what we can do. And um, yeah, I think it kind of paid off. Yeah. Fantastic. That was a very quick presentation, but we're not going to let you go so easily. We well, have I so much, much more. I, I don't want to just keep talking. I thought it was much more fun if I talked to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, but that was amazing. So um, one of the interesting things that you've done is also your mobile camping. Will you tell us about that? And does it go into both parks and outside landscapes? How does it work? Well, again, this is, this is yeah. So our mobile camp uh, is called Kafila. Uh, mm -hmm. We keep it on a very small scale only. Now we just have five tents uh, that we're going over there. And again, this idea came up through side slightly to my disappointment at the fact that we go to new places, we go to fabulous new landscapes, new national parks, and, and the government fails in one key area, which is controlling and regulating development outside the national park. Okay, to a, whatever the reasons, but that is a, to me a massive failure. And what it does is it gives, it does two things, which to me are very damaging. One, it destroys the beauty of the landscape. It destroys the aesthetic beauty of the landscape it puts a huge amount of pressure on the resources over there. It brings in jobs, of course it does. It brings in, you know, accelerated uh, economic development. But why can't we do it in a way that is aesthetically pleasing? Uh, why can't we do it imaginatively in a way that doesn't spoil the landscape? Uh, why can't we do it in a way that is respectful of local cultures and local communities, of all the things that we consider as conservation tourism? You know, conservation tourism isn't just about protecting tigers, it's protecting the entire landscape that you're operating in. You know, a responsible use of resources, a responsible way of dealing with waste, of how we direct development, 
what kind of development do we want in that area you know so all of this needs to be thought through it and it's it's not rocket science it's quite simple to do anyway so disappointment both in paint and to some extent in satpura so we thought well the next thing that we're going to do therefore is to have a mobile camp where we go in 3 4 days in one area 5 days in one area and we're gone and we do it in a way that doesn't you know that leaves two waste disposal pits which we come back and check in 6 months and you know we know that it's just all reduced to composted material so we took a long time designing it it took a year, a year and a half to get all our technologies and all our designs together and yeah we could now go to any interesting landscape off the beaten track the the strap line is beyond the last hotel so one of the key things needs to be that there shouldn't be any acceptable hostelries or accommodations in the area so one of the places we go to is kuno palpur uh which is one of our absolute favorite places classic example of how areas beyond the uh, the can of tourism actually probably suffers from big cat selective poaching because now that is directly connected by you know there's a direct corridor connecting it to ranthambore tiger reserve to that whole landscape the ranthambore kala devi protected area yeah. you would have thought with this massive prey base and the huge amount of management elements that have gone into kuno that that would be humming with tigers it should be right yeah well there're no tigers there there're no tigers there every now and again one old tiger might wander in but there're no tigers there so the tigers that are dispersing southwards along a natural dispersal route are obviously being hammered so but we go there we love it you know we go into the park we are there literally from first light to last light it's difficult wildlife viewing because the animals are not habituated but very high numbers fabulous landscapes and at one time one of the great tiger landscapes of north of of northwestern central india so that's one of our big areas we go into the mekal hills especially sort of interacting with local tribal people with beggars uh, we go up into the highlands about 3000 feet where you actually begin to experience little bit of the last of the I, I i hesitate to use the word but there is a little bit of authenticity left to those beggar cultures and which is why the person who took us there doesn't allow us to give the location because he doesn't want all the big sort of you know everybody coming in yes and the, and the big lenses coming in and spoiling it yeah, yeah. uh we go to chanderi we go to kalinjar and we go to pilibhit and the tarai we go to now a lot into kutch from next season if there is a season next year Mm-hmm. we we are going to be starting in kutch and we're really excited about that mm-hmm. and kutch is fantastic because you've got dholavira one of the great the, the biggest ivc sites in india uh you've got fabulous wildlife you've got great culture yes uh and so it just it just suits our you know the, the sort of the thesis of our camp uh, down to the ground yeah okay so a lot of questions that people ask often focus on working in this field you know and um for young people when they dream of doing something like working with kafila camps what are the sort of backgrounds that you're looking for what are the qualities in a person that help you identify somebody who can be one of your team number 1 enthusiasm mm-hmm. enthusiasm number 2 enthusiasm <laughs> uh, and i guess number 3 an ability to communicate okay uh because the one thing that i think is a truism in all wildlife guide trainers and i'm i'm not a trainer but you know i've worked with youngsters and you know taught myself to a very good extent and was taught by chuck mcdougal and so on but one of the things that i've always said to people who who come to work for us youngsters who come to work for us is if you want to do research go join an academic institution that's where you need to be mm-hmm. what we want over here are people who are excited enthused who come alive in the wilderness but are storytellers mm-hmm. who can communicate you know and which is why i say enthusiasm enthusiasm is the great quality that makes the other person smile you know uh, whoever's listening to you uh, i want people i remember david raju you know uh, was uh, you know he's 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 got one eye on you know he's got one part of his brain on the conversation or his food or whatever 
but while you know he was like a jack in the box in the you know i mean uh, suddenly he'd be up leaping about and you know catching some poor frightened dragonfly and saying new to science new to science you know and then all everybody would come around and you know and photograph and this and then the other so of course i mean david was immediately you know the name for him is new to science you know because everything is new to science you know <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a, but the enthusiasm, you know, I mean, one him, you know, uh, Surya, another one of our of our stars, you know, and, and you know, uh, all the youngsters there at the moment, you know, Vineet, uh, who's there at the moment, and the bunker, and all the, it's that that is what uh, actually. So when we talk of the educational element of wildlife tourism, well, you know, that is the educational element. You know, I mean, getting people alive, making them. lifelong acolytes of the of the jungle school of the school of the wilderness and in every aspect and and you know what is what is what is absolutely fantastic uh, latika which I, you know i mean you as a lodge owner you worked with uh, youngsters you've seen is that these guys we were sort of you know tigers while you know big mammals birds you know maybe butterflies a few trees these guys now with far better resources than we had but also a far greater sensitivity to the entire sort of ecosystem i mean they are looking at spiders in a very detailed way they're looking at little things they're looking at entire ecosystems and telling great stories yes. uh, they don't stop at just identifying and telling the little things about you know the basic breeding they're actually looking at the, you know the interweave of of networks so we used to have a program which they still do uh, at four sites called the junior rangers course and I still get mails from mothers you know who had come brought their children over there saying you know so sad to hear that you guys sold out uh, uh, I want to tell you that you know they lit you know you guys lit a fuse and we go every year we take our kids and so on so that's what we look at enthusiasm storytelling fantastic but you know this also then directly connects with this whole lockdown and the whole covid pandemic <laughs> and this horrible thing about having to wear masks mm-hmm. because it just puts this immediate barrier between you and the next person they can't see your face they can't see your smile they can't read your expression so it becomes so difficult and i personally feel that this is going to be a big issue in in wildlife tourism because your your whole enchantment with the scene is now you know halved or quartered because you've got this mask on somebody's face what do you suggest we do about this i mean how do you think we should deal with this this is a big issue oh, god you know i mean to be to, to be honest i didn't even thought of that but you absolutely no, right i mean you get on and you you get into yeah. the park and you have a mahut smiling down from an elephant at you you yeah. don't know that he's smiling anymore yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not easier to recognize the elephant. Uh, yeah. Than the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even so, if you yeah. know which elephant it was from the mouth, now it'll be the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a big issue, and you know, this is yeah. something that's been really worrying me because the smile, the warmth. Yeah. Um, and the, the muffled voice, the muffled voice. The, you yeah. Know, and and if you wear dark glasses yeah. in the field. then you literally see nothing of the face at all you know and it's um, it's sad it's really really sad so I, it I, yeah i i i you know i i i suppose i'm slightly spoiled over here because you know i'm in the middle of my house is uh, so far from anybody yeah uh, surrounded on three sides by the tiger reserve and uh, you know barely actually see anybody so i don't wear a mask on a regular mm-hmm. basis i carry it with me just in case the police get tough if yeah. i go to do any shopping yeah but i think what you're saying is extremely valid and i don't know how i suppose the only thing that we can hope for is that uh, as uh, as numbers spike as as tourism grows you know uh, who knows which way it's going i mean are we are we heading towards herd immunity i mean i've stopped even reading all of this stuff because everything everybody's contradicting everybody all the time absolutely yes uh, so it's it, it, you know it's just peja fry at the moment um maybe by the time wildlife tourism or all tourism comes back because i think all of us in this field in this conservation tourism field you know i mean which we always talk about the two elements you know i mean the conservation side of things you know i mean the effect our presence over here has on 
on the environment, on the ecosystem, on wildlife and so on. That's one end. The other end is the actual business side of it, the communication, the guiding, the, the experience for the, uh, for the client, which as you very rightly said, is everything to do with the guide. If maybe by the time, by the time people are happy to travel, by the time, you know, tourism comes back, there will be a lessening of the contagion. One can ho only hope. I, it's I, a tough I, one. I, I, I think what you say is very valid. I, I, you know, I say, because you're sitting in a vehicle with somebody, you're sitting in a hide with somebody. It's just, it's, it? yeah. it's yeah. very tough to, to, to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, it's difficult. So, yeah. so tell me, Hashim, what else have you been involved with? You know, looking at the big cat scenario and looking at the way the differences have arisen between Nepal and India on the way they handle protection of big cats and the way they run their national parks. Have you actually been involved with any of that and discussing um, how we could change things in India and learn a bit from our neighbors on, on being so much more effective because we go through these cycles of poaching but then and just as we think we're coming on top we go into another slide. Well, um, you, may, you may recall that, you know, uh, a fair few years uh, ago, uh, when I actually built this house and moved here, I kind of made a deliberate shift away from the tourism side. I mean, I used to make my bread and butter from tourism, but my everyday, what I considered my everyday sort of activities was more direct conservation in two areas. One was we started the Bansuraksha Samitis in here, I was the first head for the Vansuraksha or the Forest Protection Committees, uh, which led to my then becoming the Honorary Wildlife Warden for Shedol, which you know, which essentially meant this this area. And then uh, actually served with your father on the Indian Board for Wildlife. And so there was a lot of talk as to what, what we did. So there was the physical side of the protection uh, uh, thing as well. My, my, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I tell you is very, very clear, the difference between Nepal and India. Or used to be when I was when I was in Nepal. In Nepal, they followed a much more American system of wildlife administration of the conservation management system. In that, it was much less hierarchical. There wasn't this militarized system. You know, I mean, we have because our wildlife uh, department was created by ex British Army officers, Indian Army officers back in the 1860s. The, you know, the whole uniform things. I mean, why is a forester come to a senior officer and salutes him? Where, where does that come from? Why are they in berets? Why are they in military uniforms? Where is this hierarchy from? So, so you know, that hierarchy was created because it was created by army officers. And we've just slavishly stuck to that. We have a very, very, uh, I, the only way to describe the forest department's attitude, and this is, and you know, forest officers think it's a criticism of them. It's not. It's not a criticism of individuals because they are fabulous individuals in the service who have made... It's not the people outside the conservation fraternity outside who have protected tigers. It's the forest department that has protected tigers for better or ill. We all agree. So we all agree, but we can say, yes, guys, credit where credit is due, but the system needs reform to be even more effective. Now, the Nepal system, they were, they, they, you know, they, there was a lot of very egalitarian American systems. They, they were open-minded. They looked to outside help. They brought in help from wherever. It was a much more porous system of expertise being recruited. They themselves, many of them, many of the managers there, actually were, were researchers with the Smithsonian. They worked very closely with scientists. So there was a massive scientific, they were in, the management was informed by science and supported by tourism, you know, which is the Troika we always talk about, right? Management has to be informed by science. It can't be that somebody who's come from social forestry gets, you know, promoted as director of a national park and then, you know, is, is bringing his own arbitrary whims, fancies, biases, prejudices to play. And then if a scientist goes and criticizes them, the scientist is the bad guy. Okay, so that is one problem. You then have this direct entry into the officer class. You have this, this, this thing. In a forest service, there should be entry at one level. And that level should be at the forest guard level. And we shouldn't call them forest guards. We should call them rangers. 
they should be trained they should come up to a particular standard they should be superbly equipped and they should all be properly qualified they should all sit for the same exam and then they all rise to the ranks from the bottom to the top it's the same service all the way to the top okay that is how a senior manager understands the problems of a junior ranger in the field at the moment they do because none of them have sat in a little choki in the middle of the monsoon 6 days march away in in malarial forest they haven't done it the physical uh, this thing so when the guy says you know oh you you're not patrolling the area well buddy i don't have the equipment to patrol the area and you you and you are sitting comfortably you know where your children can get educated <laughs> we don't have you know i mean the, the nepal army rightly or wrongly you know recruited the uh, the nepal forest service you know i mean has the army a battalion of the army protecting uh, the whole thing so there is and they use it as a training ground for jungle warfare good bad i don't know but they're certainly effective because you certainly don't want to meet a fully armed gorkha soldier uh, in the middle of the jungle right i think far more far more scary than you know meeting a forest guard with an old 315 so we have, yeah we have lots of lessons to learn uh, you know i mean one thing i've i've never understood latika look at look at this you look at when i first started working you know in this field uh, and going to the jungles the head of the forest department of a state i'm talking about 1976 was a chief conservator of forests then finally it became a principal chief conservator for it because there was an explosion of ccfs now there's an explosion of pccfs just calculate how many resources a pccf soaks up doing what in bhopal or jaipur or delhi or wherever at the cost of whom at the cost of the recruitment of the front line of defense which is your forest guard now how ridiculous can it be that a country like india essentially a superpower one of the biggest economies in the world but our tiger reserves had to ask for funding from the general public for to supply rations into into the park okay now the our poor conservation managers uh, the the guys on the ground out here they're struggling because they are, they are told by the government i mean the ridiculous situations where ntca is giving sending budgets which are so restrictive that you can use this money for compensation for tigers but not for elephant damage so there's more ample money but no porosity because ntca says no you can't do it you know so there you know where does one start so the reform of the system the reform of law i and i think we can learn a heck of a lot i can you know i give you a little example you know let's go a little bit further afield borneo i was in borneo and i wanted to see uh pitcher plants you know uh, the largest pitcher plant you know uh which is in one of the parks in borneo we came in slightly late and there was a very humble looking guy locking up over there and my guide said oh wait 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 you know he's the he's the world's greatest expert on pitcher plants you know i'll go and talk to him so this humble guy you know came along he said yeah yeah come along so he locked up and things like that. and we went off it was the director of the park it was the director of the park okay mount kinabalu one of the most important parks in south asia, in, in in asia and he just he said come 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 and he had joined he was a tribal from the area he had joined as as a ranger got educated did his phd in edinburgh came to india and nepal and you know to east and to northeastern india because there's a pitcher plant there also that he wanted to study and went back that's the difference amazing amazing you know? so where do you start i i think um another thing that we do need to talk about is i mean we we've, we've talked about changes in the forest department the way it functions as a body we've talked about the complete lack of controlling unplanned development on the outskirts of the park but i think a third area which is really really important is the complete lack of coordination between different arms of the government when dealing with national parks no. the left arm doesn't know what the right arm is doing and 
you know it just and and then there's this division between the state and the center which is um you know enough to drive everyone absolutely batty yeah. so i think um these are all issues that we we really need to really need to take into account um also to me very sadly is the fact that nowhere in india does the education system take into account that there needs to be a special sort of education for the children living on the edges of these national parks you know something that teaches them about their livelihood and i'd love to hear your views on uh, on you, that uh, latika you know uh, let me just quickly add to what you said earlier about the different arms of department i mean you know it is it is so dependent on personalities mm -hmm. okay we've had situations over here that the wildlife wing that is the the park management and the territorial management have been at complete loggerheads forget between different departments this is within the department mm -hmm. and between revenue so it all boy in the indian system everything boils down to personalities much more so than in other systems and uh, yeah i mean you know i mean that's a cat's cradle of 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 complication so you know we could talk forever on that yeah but education is something you know you've absolutely hit the nail on the head so i because that is you know what we call the foundational knowledge and i was just saying to somebody who works for uh, who does uh, extension work and a uh, conflict mitigation work in the uh, environs of Bandugar uh, for one of the NGOs and you know he he, he takes meetings and things like a very good guy and does all this work but i was saying to my said you know every time you take a conflict uh, management or conflict mitigation meeting you're only talking to those individuals and then they will go away and a year later they'll have forgotten but what about the 80% who didn't come to the meeting so what we have to do we have to address youngsters this has to you're absolutely right it has to be a fundamental element of education over here so what and and you know it's very simple so uh right at this moment i'm working with my village school here trying to make it into some kind of a model school so that you know we can then use it and say to funding agencies and government to say hey guys you know very little money is needed to change this and we're doing a simple thing we're doing two simple things we're putting in drinking water in there which we've already done we're going to try and improve the toilets but before that we are putting in an audio visual a full audio visual kit completely connected up with to the internet and maybe i'm still waiting to hear maybe geo will give us a helping hand over there so, so we the bathrooms are now also so so classrooms will become a quasi digital classroom yes and that will suddenly open up the world to these people now the government actually the the education department actually has some very very good software for teaching kids mm -hmm. surprisingly good so i've gone through it uh, mm -hmm. the headmaster showed me but they don't know in these tribal villages how do they get to the kids the kids don't have the hardware so this is what so they i said what was the solution they, they said this and i said yep exactly what i was thinking once we get that how difficult then is it to put a cooler in each classroom and a whiteboard simple isn't it just a yeah. bit of money you've got electricity you've got i mean geo has done an amazing job and where airtel is airtel is damn good as well it's actually quicker than it's it's a it's better broadband than geo even where it operates so between those two just get a dongle and the world is at your at your fingertips and there are fantastic you know ngos have come up with fantastic learning aids uh, digital learning aids the government has great learning aids and i am fingers crossed the teachers in these government schools are almost like dormant plants you know just need a bit of water yes you know? yeah 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 so hashim is there a place that these teachers can go to to access you know where they can get these programs from because most people would not know is oh, there yeah. a way that we could put this together yeah, yeah the government has it the government's already got everything in place the so entire when, what do we go to when they need to access this what site do they access uh i, I it's a whatsapp group that they access okay, okay. so what the government has done it has created a very very effective uh -huh. uh, digital infrastructure uh -huh. it, it's it's deeply impressive latika and you know i mean it yeah i'm really impressed by what the work they've so done how can one get on this group just go to just go to uh, uh, a government school 
okay. uh, and speak to uh, the, the computer science teacher. So, okay. I mean, here's the interesting thing. So, our school doesn't have a computer or an internet, but it has a computer science teacher. Uh, we don't have a computer science teacher. I've given lots of computers and set up the whole system. We now have computers, we have a TV, we have an electricity connection, which I pay for. Yeah. And um, so we've started all of that, but we don't have a computer science teacher, so I don't know how to access. Well, if, the if it's a government school in Madhya Pradesh, anyway, what mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. know, you mm -hmm. don't actually have to pay the for the electricity because there's a budget there for electricity. Yeah, we'll look for it, but you know, we got it going, so it's there. Okay. So how I'm just saying. So, so what happens is, yeah, it's not, it's not. But I'm just saying that to give government credit. Mm -hmm. It actually has a full interest. So I was asking these guys because we were we were talking to the panchayat as to the different streams of uh, revenue that they can harness to make this happen. So I said, you've got to do your best. The gap, I will make arrangements, you know, uh, to to do that. So we are putting in a laptop, a projector, a dongle, and a screen. Fantastic. And so you know exactly what you've done. I'm now talking to various people who are going to put in whiteboards for mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. The the way the the uh, the digital the digital classrooms work is that all the teaching uh, material is distributed to the schools and from the schools to the students individually through WhatsApp through links on the WhatsApp. Okay. They go straight onto that. As soon as they log on, they their presence their attendance is logged into the master system. But that's assuming everybody has a phone. That's the problem. That's so the that problem. Is, that is the problem. So that is exactly why we are trying to say, okay, the hardware is the issue. The data, the cost of data is the issue. So this is where we are going into the digital classroom and saying, all right, that's not going to work. So this is how we're going to do it. And the whiteboards will then be connected up to the uh, to the uh, software that the government is distributing, and that will then be available to every class automatically. And, and then once that works, well, then who knows? You know, maybe people will see that it's you know reconditioned hardware can be brought into into service, and we can talk to people. But we need that one thing, and the one and the one great thing that all uh, the teachers and I both discuss is don't make it heavy going. You know, the first thing that kids need to be entertained, they need right. to be sparked. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was also talking to um, Discovery Channel and Discovery is actually doing a program where, you know, one of these uh, programs for education and they're asking a lot of people to come in as speakers on this and they approached me and I actually put down the condition saying, I'll come and work for you and I'll do it for free. But what I want you to do is then make these resources available to tribal schools around national parks, especially in Madhya Pradesh, um, free of cost, uh, because the schools can't afford to subscribe to your channels. But you do it free of cost and give this resource into school. So I think um, slowly everything will fall into place. And Absolutely. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Yeah. Um, Last thing that I mean, just before we we end for the day, the whole issue of increased resource use because of unmanaged tourism coming into these parks, and you know, and I know that this is a huge issue. I've seen what you do with Kafila. I've seen what you do at Foresight. I've seen the Snow Leopard Lodge, but this is not. It's not the example that most people are following. Most people come in build a concrete construction, get tourists in, make huge garbage dumps and think that it's all going to go away or they can just stick their heads into sand like an ostrich and forget it exists. But now we're reading about plastic rain and we're reading about plastic particles going into everything um, and it's it's impossible. So what what would you suggest we can do about that? Oh, okay, you know, uh, so obviously this is something that's exercise that's been exercising us a lot, and you know, in uh, it's in India, it's a real mess at the moment. Because, however, so there's there's, there's two things. One is resource use. So you know, I mean, water water management. You know, in a country which is which is very quickly going to die uh, because of, uh, of 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 a, of a subcontinental thirst. Uh, that is something we all need to worry about and think about. 
So, you know, I mean, you and us and, you know, the small community of so-called responsible uh, operations, you know, we, we do all the right things. Uh, just to also tell you that, you know, uh, at the Snow Leopard Lodge now, we are maybe a year or two years as we, you know, uh, come back out of this COVID pandemic. We're actually going to go back in our loose, uh, even in the winter, we're going to go back to the Ladakhi system of composting toilets because we believe that uh, a Western style toilet is simply not appropriate to that area. And, you know, what was there was much more appropriate. So, we, you know, we're going to make that change. Garbage. Now, here's the classic example. So we have a three-stage garbage separation thing, like we all do, right? What is composted is composted. What can be sold to the to the you know the diwala and you know that is all. It. What do you do with the rest, the plastic? What do you do with it? What do you do with it? You take it to a government dump. What does the government do with it? Nothing. Burn it or leave it. So, until and unless, so, you know, I, I love the way a lot of critics of, of tourism and especially wildlife conservation, whatever tourism you want to call this, turn around and say, well, see, garbage disposal. So, I always tell them, I said, okay, so tell me, give me an end. What do you do end to end in your own homes, guys? Do you have some magical way of dealing with the plastic that you generate and all of us generate plastic? So if you can't deal with the small amount of domestic plastic you are generating because your responsibility ends when you give it to the uh, Sarkari fellow who comes and collects your uh, garbage and takes it to the dump, you think you've done a good thing because you've separated everything. I said, we also do that. But where is the end-to-end -end solution? Where do we go? Now, I tell you in Bandhavgarh, so I started taking it up. I mean, you haven't come to Tala for a bit or you may have, I don't know, but Tala is a mess. So they yeah. clean the, the front and chuck it all into the by lanes at the back. Yeah. Okay. It's a mess. And I've been trying to work with the panchayat. I've been trying to tell the field director. I've been, you know, I've been trying to talk to these guys, you know. And I have various plans which are self-financing, but they're not willing to listen. Let's see. But they were telling me that the government had, uh, uh, was going to put a solid waste disposal unit over here. The forest department had found space for them and, and it's on the Rancha Road. Uh, not far from Monsoon Forest, but this COVID thing came in the way and you know, so if you talk to the panchayat, there's one excuse. If you speak to the forest department, there's another excuse. Long and short of it is, it isn't there at the moment. But then, if it's a Sarkari system, what a, who's going to collect the garbage? How is it going to be funded? How do you finance it? We don't think these solutions through, you know. Uh, the, uh, the the local area committee under the commissioner or collector or whoever will simply turn around and say you are not doing your job well boss you are the administration you know we think you should do this that and the other and we should do this that and the other it's because until you actually have a proper robust self-financing model for collection of waste and then disposal of waste you're going to have an empty waste disposal, solid waste uh, uh, disposal unit sitting out there because the Pajayat will turn around and say, we don't have the money to, the people are not paying taxes. Yeah. 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 So, oh, well, we, could, we could talk about this and more forever. I mean, there's a hundred more things that I could talk with you about. But thank you so much for doing this, Hashim. Thank um, you. Thank Thanks, it's Ladika. Wonderful. goal going forward is to find uh, newer audiences to watch the conservation stories yeah. that we have to prepare.